When that starts, I'm going to go. OK, it looks like we've begun. Welcome, everyone. It's been uh, several weeks since we've had a meeting because of the um, cessation for summertime. So welcome, everyone. I hope a few people uh, join. I'm really looking forward to the, the talk today. I'm just going to drop a link for the schedule, as per usual, into the chat. In case you'd like to see what's happening, I guess everybody's on the email list, but um, if anybody is new to these, uh, we usually record the meeting and um, I'll upload and make links with any resources if a speaker gives them. Looking ahead for the next few weeks, I've had uh, an inordinate amount of requests recently for, um, for uh, power analysis support. And uh, we've done this quite a lot in here. And um, next week, what I'm going to do is go over some of the um, the basics of power analysis for experimental design and, and talk about two different recent um, designs that I've, I worked on. Week after that, I'm going to use um, YOLO for um, for uh, a computer vision classification model in Python. Show the setup. Hi, Anna. And uh, after that, uh, another experimental design. I've had so many requests recently that um, I thought I'd just go it. And Ronald is a new PhD student um, who's in the chat today. Uh, and it, I think that's a straightforward design. So I'm going to talk about a, an advanced design and, and some basics. And then we'll look at kind of a, an intermediate design from Ronald in a few weeks. After that, I'll be looking for some volunteers. So if anybody feels like they've got something to say, um, just let me let me know and I'll sign you up. Or uh, I may, if I know that you have something to say, possibly, I may ask you to do that. Another thing I wanted to say before I hand it over is um, drop this link in the chat. It's the ad for a two-year postdoc that's um, just been released today. Hope that it can start as early as possible in January, if possible, but the interviews will be at the earliest, uh, January 15th. So if anybody's interested or if you know anybody who may be interested, feel free to advertise that far and wide. I'll be tweeting it and LinkedIn-ing it um, in the coming weeks. And I think that's it. With that uh, said, I'm going to hand it over. I'm really looking forward to see, seeing the talk today on uh, cattle welfare and uh, and heat for a new project that Tom Chamberlain is going to walk us through. And if I can, I'm just going to load up your talk, share the slides so that we're all ready to go. What this is going to do is something funny. So I'm going to slip the screen like that. And with that, I think we're ready to go. OK, thank you very much, Ed. All right, swap into the hot seat. Yes. All right. <laughs> I can't see anyone though now. You've all disappeared. I can. Uh, you would like to see people. We can make that small and put it over there. Would that be better? Oh, that'll work. That'll work. Okay. And just next to get to the next slide. Is it on the setup? Now you can try page down. It may work. Yeah, I was afraid of that. So you may have to use the mouse and click on your slide there. That might work too. Now page down. That's better. Okay. Right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for um, coming along and joining in uh, on this session. Um, it's really much very much a work in progress, this. Uh, I've been thinking and looking at heat stress for quite a few years um, and actually started on the MSC last year uh, because my data science is rather old and rusty. Uh, it was all mini tab and Excel driven, uh, and I thought I ought to learn to do better. Um, or oh, my cow has gone to sleep again. <laughs> All right. Um, so yes, I'm interested in uh, developing, as it says there, uh, a cow-based technique for assessing heat stress uh, in dairy cows. Uh, there are some available in the literature, um, but none really that you can sensibly apply on commercial farms. Okay. So a little bit about who I am. Um, I trained as a veterinary surgeon. Uh, I can't really say I'm a veterinary surgeon anymore. There's nothing in my car that James Herriot would recognise. Uh, and I've spent my career uh, in academia uh, at Bristol University and Reading University uh, and in, in cattle practice. 
Uh, and over the years, uh, I did, I've developed some nutrition courses. I think we taught those for about 27 years and developed some software and a textbook behind that. Uh, so I've always had a very numerate approach uh, to uh, veterinary science. Uh, my bread and butter uh, now is working with uh, the feed industry, uh, feed companies, um, and converting uh, a very ugly database, uh, which is produced by the milk recording companies, into a, a very large Excel spreadsheet uh, that they can then pick apart uh, and use to drive their businesses. Um, and then uh, last year, I enrolled for the MSc uh, and did the first year uh, as a remote part-time student. Uh, and as I said earlier, I live in Southampton, so I'm mostly going to be working remotely. So I'm keen for as much feedback and help as I can get from, from you folks. Uh, and obviously, um, if I can help with anything about working on farms, working with farmers, understanding dairy cows, um, then I'm more than willing to help. Uh, looking at this, probably Joe won't need my help, but willing to help anyone else. Uh, Joe's in practice in Cheshire, so uh, he knows uh, more than I do, I think, about cows. I'm always Did willing, you? Tom. Sorry? I'm always willing to receive help. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always good to chew things over. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, do chip in uh, if you want to win it, anything as we go along. Um, I don't think you'll knock me off my stride. Uh, we'll, we'll cope. OK, so how the project grew um, back in 2020 uh, and spanning COVID, I uh, led a project funded by Innovate UK, uh, basically trying to encourage cows to eat more grass um, because the major limitation on production of grass is they won't eat enough. Um, and they'll eat a lot more inside. Uh, and I ended up with uh, running trials on farms in the south of England. Uh, and I was basically sending cows out to eat grass at a hot time of day, which they didn't really enjoy. Uh, and I started to feel a bit uh, nervous that we were compromising their welfare. Um, you know, on a hot, sunny day, they just want to go and stand under a hedge uh, and not sit in the, stand outside uh, in the full sun. So that followed on. Um, I started working with Lalamond Animal Nutrition, who make uh, anything that's involved with yeast. Um, and we had two aims on that. The first aim was to really persuade UK farmers that heat stress was a worry. Uh, when I first started posting on things like LinkedIn, uh, I was getting emails from people in Saudi saying, yeah, heat stress, we've got it sussed. You just do this, this and this. Come on, let's move on. Uh, and I was trying to say, well, how about in Yorkshire? And in Scotland and in Northern Ireland, uh, that's not really how they're thinking. Uh, it's very different weather. Um, and did we actually get a problem? So spent a lot of time um, doing uh, LinkedIn posts and websites and things, uh, monitoring heat stress on farms um, and trying to uh, persuade farmers uh, that we have got heat stress. And I think in the past two years, uh, we have um, certainly increased the, the farmer awareness of it seeing a lot of fans going in and so forth. As part of that, I realised that the way I was measuring heat stress, which were the industry standard ways, aren't really very good. Um, they only measure the environment. They don't think about the cows. Uh, and so the past year or two, I've been collecting farm data. And that's mainly what I want to speak about uh, now, um, is how I've been collecting the data, uh, explain some of the technology I've been using um, and you know, hopefully it might be of some interest to others for collecting data in other ways. OK, so where I've got to then, uh, I'm there in the middle, on, uh, in the purple uh, section, uh, very much trying to work out what to do uh, to refine my project ideas. Uh, I've been uh, mangling the data uh, to get it into some form of sense, but I'm now thinking, you know, what are the best ways to do it? Uh, there must be something better than just linear regression. And then hopefully uh, it'll carry on next summer. Uh, we'll do some refined data collection, some better modelling. Uh, and the aim is to write it up um, uh, over next winter uh, and get it submitted. So it's very much a work in progress. It's not a finished product. It's not a polished product. I'm still working out ideas uh, and ideas from folks would be great, please. OK, so, yep, just a little bit of background. Um, heat stress uh, is the same in uh, humans, in any animal, 
uh, is the excessive accumulation of heat. And one thing I've learned is if you have a dull slide, drop some infrared pictures in there uh, and they suddenly liven it all up. Um, but you can actually see something of clinical usefulness. This is the cow's rumen is tucked away behind her ribs here on the left hand side. And that is really a very big heat generator. Cows, compared to some other species, or monogastrics, compared to monogastrics, they're really fairly inefficient at how they convert energy into something that we as humans can use into milk and meat. Uh, the magic about cows is that they can do it by eating grass um, and they can break down cellulose, uh, which monogastrics can't do. Um, so the magic is they can use grass, which we can produce plentifully and cheaply. Uh, the problem is they produce a lot of heat when they're breaking it down. So we've got a lot of heat being produced by the cow. As we get hotter weather, we get greater heat inputs. Uh, and the thing that's compromised is the animal's ability to lose heat. Now, uh, it affects grazing in house cows. And I put it up there because if you look in the literature, it's all from America, uh, from Florida, from Georgia, from the hot states like that. Uh, and they seem to have forgotten that cows eat grass because everything is housed. Um, and I've been trying to okay, persuade myself and others that it is quite a big problem in grazing cows as well. On a hot summer's day, probably it's quite a severe welfare insult to make cows go out and eat grass. So why is it a growing problem? Um, the stock answer is global warming. Uh, we can use that to answer just about every question. Um, uh, and with global warming, yes, average temperatures are rising and we're getting more heat waves. Um, this slide probably needs revising. The best scenario now is we'll probably overshoot two degrees centigrade, I guess. Um, the thing that affects cows is this inefficiency of breaking down cellulose in grass into usable end products. Um, and as their milk yields go up, therefore, uh, the amount of heat they're producing goes up. And over the years, we've been selecting cows' genetic uh, progress to increase milk yields. And if we look at cows doing 40 litres a day, and we've got some herds where the entire herd will be averaging 40 litres a day. And the Americans would be sniffy about that figure and say it wasn't very good. Um, but that girl, she's pushing out 18 times more heat than I am, uh, or any of us are. And she's actually pushing out more heat than the office heater that we've got. I've got in the corner of my office back at home. It's a serious amount of heat that she's trying to lose. Um, this is from uh, feeding standards, feeding to built feeding standards. That's theoretical. Uh, over here, uh, someone actually did it uh, experimentally. And at 30 litres, 32 litres of milk, it's pretty good if you put an animal in a closed box. He's got a 50% increase in heat output. So we've got two reasons why it's becoming a growing problem. I so say these are some of the technologies I've been using um, and to measure heat stress. Two methods in the literature. The main one is the American one. It's as old as the hills, um, 1972. And for how many other systems we've got where the standard method, method of measurement is what 50 years old um, we, uh, room for improvement possibly okay and it's based just on the temperature and the relative humidity so the system i've been using is i have a box in here which is measuring uh, temperature humidity also measures lux uh, and then there's a, a a cat6 cable running out to a device here a solar powered device uh, which is sending the data out um, a lot of previous workers and a lot of technology on, on farm is you have a little gadget you've bought off the internet, uh, you strap it to the um, that pillar there, and then you come back six, eight weeks later and download your data. Um, and all you can say is, gee, it's been hot recently. Um, so I was trying to move on from that. Grazing, um, the Australian, the Americans have forgotten about Australian uh, grazing, so there's not much in literature from them. It's a little bit coming out of Queensland, but again, the northern states uh, up in uh, of Australia, uh, Queensland, Northern Territory, so forth. And they're starting to bring in what's called the black globe temperature. Uh, and it is, it's just a simple black globe, 150 millimetres across, sprayed black uh, with some paint. And in the middle of that is a temperature sensor. Uh, and this is just a summer's day down in Hampshire. Uh, the air temperature, that's the standard way of measuring air temperature would be a, a white screened uh, enclosure of about 29 degrees centigrade. 
when you point the infrared camera at it, um, the black globe up at 44 degrees centigrade. So we're more thinking more about what temperature the cow is feeling uh, rather than air temperature. Um, and 44 degrees centigrade, uh, if you're wearing a black coat like this girl is, that you know, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to think that's really quite uncomfortable. Uh, and it's not surprising the cows behave uh, in many of the ways they do. OK, so what are the effects? The main one that hits the farmers and the farmers worry about is it reduces feed intake uh, and it reduces uh, milk output. So we've got uh, this is from Georgia, uh, typical data from America, uh, from the southern states. Uh, as the air temperature goes up, uh, intakes drop off quite dramatically. Uh, the black one is the line for the black and white cows, the common ones we have, going for 21 kilos, which I think we would say in this country is pretty poor. Um, and at 32 degrees centigrade, you know, we're down at 15 kilos, and that will really hit milk production. And you can see it here, yeah, milk production is dropping off considerably. Again, some Australian data, we can come back to um, starting to look at what that response is like. Um, should it be linear? Should it be quadratic? Should it be broken stick? Um, what sort of a response should we be using? Okay, does it happen in England? Uh, this is some work from um, a large dairy farm uh, in Berkshire. It's not the university farm, it's the other one. Uh, there's only two big farms down there. The yellow line is the THI, and you can see here in the middle of July, it went up from about 65 up to 75. And then typical response is that two or three days later, milk yields uh, fall away. So this farm, during that period, his milk yields dropped 3,000 litres a day. Um, and at the milk prices he was getting, uh, that's about ten, about a thousand pounds per day. OK. So it's fairly significant. There won't be any savings. Uh, he can't change his feeding or anything. And as you see in the next few slides, uh, there are other impacts as well. So he was probably losing two thousand pounds a day. Uh, it's also one of the few farms I've met in this country where he's actually had cows dying of heat stress. It will kill them. So here's one um, with increased uh, res res respiration rate. That's the first thing they do, really. They're not like humans. They're not very good at sweating. Uh, they're more like dogs. Uh, they're more prone to panting to get rid of, um, of, of any surplus heat if she's got. And the longer you look at this picture, and I have, she's panting, she's panting, she's panting, she's panting. And I don't know what that is doing. Um, but you know, they're all panting. And the important thing to me uh, as a production veterinarian is that she's not doing much else, really. Um, she's not out eating food. Uh, and the important thing, really, is that she's not chewing the cud. Uh, and if cows are just stood around doing nothing, uh, that's actually their production is going to fall away. And it, it wasn't that hot at the time. Um, uh, it was 27 degrees centigrade in that shed. Uh, and we could calculate the THIs. And from the literature, the literature would say these THI values aren't really that high. Um, but she was, is definitely suffering. Her production is going to suffer as well. It has an effect on fertility. Um, working with cattle fertility data is extremely difficult because they only conceive once a year. Um, so you have a huge number of cows, a long time period and not much data. Um, but this is a farm uh, I worked with down in South Wales. Well, nothing here tells me the time. It's dangerous. All right. <laughs> Up here. Right. 26 minutes in. 26 minutes in, right. OK. Um, OK, this is a, a typical unit. Um, he's got robots, uh, 180 cows in robots, each cow giving about 12 tonnes of milk a year. Um, he's working, trying to make it work very well. And the critical thing about uh, these robotic systems, you have three very expensive uh, machines to milk the cows. He really wants to have those cows working optimally all the way through. So his aspiration is that every month, 15 cows will calve down. Uh, so the robots are always working consistently. Uh, 
despite his best efforts, and he's a very good farmer, uh, he's got various times when there's great big holes in his carving numbers. If we backtrack a bit and look here in April and uh, March, he only had, you know, what's that, 14 and 12 cows carving. Uh, that was even less than that, sorry. That was 12 combined, I guess, um, when he wanted 30. If we track that back nine months before, um, it was 32 degrees centigrade. We had a heat wave there. Similarly, in June, uh, nine months before, 31 degrees centigrade. Uh, interestingly, you track back from September, nine months before September is Christmas. So it's not just heat stress that causes problems. Um, everyone going off and getting excited about Christmas can also affect fertility. OK, so to look at heat stress, what have we? I've been doing? Uh, fairly simple data recording, temperature, humidity, this black go temperature as a saying, and then we obviously need a timestamp and bits and pieces like that. What I was aiming to do was to have um, hourly THI uh, or DHLI figures, and to achieve that, I tend to sample every 20 minutes um, because there's various reasons why you don't always get all the data you want. Um, and if you've got three results an hour, taking the median starts to give you some protection from outliers. Um, so it's starting to improve the data quality. So how I've been doing it, um, the main hardware I've been using is a system called Particle. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. Uh, more than happy to share what I've been doing. Uh, I've got a couple in the car. Um, they're fairly clean now. Uh, welcome to show them. It's the American based system and it's fairly good a platform as a service. Um, you buy your hardware and then all um, the software development, all the cloud support and everything is built in. Um, if you don't use too many uh, and you don't generate too much data, it's free. Um, so uh, you know, so try it, uh, trial it out uh, at an academic level. Uh, it's free and the units cost about 100, 150 pounds. Um, I don't, I produce too much data, so I'm now paying 300 pounds a month or Lala Mondar anyway. Um, it's a uh, communication system that uses, or I've chosen to use, is cellular. Um, I've tried with LoRaWAN and things on other projects. The lovely thing about cellular is if you phone the farmer up, all you have to say is, what's your mobile phone like? And you instantly know how good the signal is. Mm. Um, uh, with others, it can be a problem. It's also fairly self-contained. Um, working with commercial farmers, you have to have a very light footprint. So I'm not running around saying, where do I plug this in? Your internet isn't very good. Your computer isn't very good. Um, I just fit my box and hopefully it goes. The, the particle add-on, Tom, is just, a, uh, just for the data transfer and it, it plugs into a system with a microprocessor too? Yeah, they supply the microprocessors. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through the steps uh, in, a, in a tick. The downside is um, that the cellular networks are changing all the time. Uh, we've got this sun setting that they all talk about. Um, particle are very good at evolving, which is great. Um, but in terms of my maintaining it, it's a bit of a bugger because every year the hardware changes slightly. Mm. So you have to go back quite a long way to revalidate your software. OK, so the hardware, um, for those familiar with Arduinos and so forth, this has got the same form factor as an Adafruit feather, which is very widely used. Um, for, for data handling, microprocessor collection. OK, um, these are the specs that came off the Internet. Uh, it's a reasonably fast processor, a reasonable amount of, of memory. Um, I started uh, with 328 chips, the very first ones. Uh, and when you work with microprocessors, you suddenly start thinking about data and how much you're collecting and how much it can, uh, space it's taking and so forth. So they are a little bit limited on that. You could plug a wide range of things into it, um, various uh, communication protocols. I mostly use I2C um, and some analog and digital uh, signals as well. It's quite nice. It's designed for remote use. You can plug a battery in here. You can plug a power supply over here uh, and it will very quick, easily. It's built in that it will cope with solar panels. So um, 
that's all all fitted for you. Um, and for longer term use, uh, it's fully certified um, for all the wireless uh, requirements that there are around the world. Uh, the bug, as we just said, is that it's no longer available. Um, uh, something's changed with the modem. They can't get the parts, so it's moved on. Uh, and so I'm now struggling to move on as well. Uh, programming is, is done in C. Uh, if you've played with Arduinos, which I started with, it's a fairly simple logical progression. Um, it's pretty well supported in terms of, uh, of a workbench. Uh, they have what they call libraries, and you just pull in a library, uh, and that does all the nitty gritty of communication with your sensors um, and presents the data reasonably sent, uh, uh, simply. OK, so a range of, of different sensors you can use. Uh, you just have to hunt around for the libraries. Um, so I really like libraries in R, I suppose. Um, someone will have written one and made it publicly available. OK, uh, it's fairly easy to program it. Uh, most of it I do at desktop level with the USB, but you can also do it over the air. So if you've set your machine up correctly, if you find a, a glitch halfway through the season, you can reprogram it, even though it's 200 miles away. Um, and there's quite nice um, debugging facilities and progressing, and you can see various bits of information. Here, this is data I look at just to make sure it's going correctly, and I can see I've got temperatures, uh, 10 degrees centigrade, humidity 83, uh, and then a, a light level there. And it's pretty much in real time. Um, you know, there's probably a, a 30 second, one minute uh, lag between data collection and it appearing here uh, and also uh, on uh, other sites as well. How many units do you have going before you click over that threshold of $300 a month or well, pounds a month? Uh, it's probably about 15 or 20. Mm. Hence how fast you're hammering data through. Mm. Um, yeah. It's also pretty good at exporting data elsewhere. Um, I'm using ThingSpeak, which is something that's part of MATLAB. Um, it can go to other places. Uh, you can get uh, fairly uh, crude um, shunting into the internet. There are limits. You can only put sort of eight variables can be uploaded, um, and you can't do it that frequently. Um, but you can uh, produce simple line graphs within this ThingSpeak. Um, and then it has a public facility uh, that you can cut and paste um, iframe snippets out uh, and put them across into the internet. Uh, I've only been using the bits I needed. Once I found what I needed, I moved on. Um, it does do a lot of other things. Uh, people with other experiences, uh, I'm sure, I could get it to do other bits and pieces. Um, so, so farmers could see what was going on. Uh, We've also integrated it uh, onto a, a website on the internet. Uh, that's the web address, but it's not working very well anymore because everything's solar powered and solar power over the last two weeks has not been a real good one. Uh, so they're all just slowly going to sleep. Um, but this summer we've had these over, uh, you know, I'm based down here, that's why they're clustered down here, but I've also had them in Northern Ireland, up in Scotland um, uh, and up in Yorkshire. Yeah, and we are finding that we, uh, even up in uh, this is Edinburgh and Belfast, uh, they were finding signs of heat stress. So why don't I like THI um, and uh, DHI as well? Um, cows move around, these devices are strapped to pillars um, and found some buildings where you think, yeah, that over there, that part of the shed is really quite nasty. Um, uh, so it doesn't capture all the different microclimates. It doesn't cope with cows going outside, certainly THI doesn't. Uh, and finding working with um, a company in Belfast, that it's not very good with some of the novel uh, roofing materials plastics industry is coming up with. Um, it takes nothing into account about the cow, um, and it takes nothing into account about how animals are adapting. And we're seeing various attempts uh, to to mitigate against heat stress with genetic changes and so forth. OK, and I suppose lastly, um, as a sort of engineering point of view, is you can't use it to control and optimise your systems. A common system is, is putting fans in. You can't use the data that 
that is coming out of these THI assessments to decide when to turn your fans on and off. Because you're only measuring the environment, you're not measuring the cow. Mm. Um, so there's various uh, organisations uh, beginning to say we need to move on and start looking at the cow. So the question I've got, and the question I'd like to investigate over the next year, uh, and now I've yet to decide whether I do, um, is uh, can we use data from uh, milking parlours? All cows get milked. That's why they're, they're dairy cows. Um, so uh, been very poor as an industry, really, of using milk data. Um, now it's, there's oodles and oodles of it coming out of, say, the, the, the milking parlour uh, on the university farm. Uh, we don't use it as well as we should do. Um, it could tell us a lot. OK. OK, so heat stress is core body temperature going up. Um, you know, it's, I'm not going to repeat the experiment. I don't think anyone would. But uh, the temperature of milk is really the same as the core body temperature. Mm. Uh, for understandable ethical reasons, it's a very old experiment because uh, it's very, very invasive. Milk temperature is very easy to measure. Uh, it's everywhere. It's flowing around. Uh, and we can measure it. But logically, the further away from the cow we measure the milk temperature, it's going to cool down. So can we capture that? Can we characterise that? So really, my question then is, can we use milk temperature to pick up changes in core body temperature and therefore how much heat stress the cow is suffering? So, yeah, uh, right. Where do we measure the temperature? OK, this is a, a very simplistic view of a milking parlour. I'll show you some real ones in a tick. Um, here's the cow, obviously, um, and the milking unit. If we measure the temperature here, that's going to be very close to the milk temperature in the udder, which is going to be the same really as the cow's temperature. So we really are measuring core body temperature. But I think you know, to put a sensor at this level is going to be extremely difficult. Um, it's very vulnerable to damage. It's a very, very hostile environment. Mm. Anyone who's worked with cows, there's not much that you can put in the milking parlour of fancy electronics that will survive. Uh, it gets stood on by something that weighs three quarters of a ton. It gets blasted with a high pressure uh, water. Uh, it gets doused in fairly corrosive chemicals from time to time. Uh, and it gets uh, kicked and hit by the, the operator when it won't work. So looked at coming back to measuring it a bit further away from the cow at, at point B. Um, there's an intermittent flow there. Uh, and the biggest problem is that probably on half of our milking parlours, point B isn't fixed. Point B is going round and round in circles, as we'll see in a, in a minute, uh, which is going to po pose logistical problems with putting your sensors on there and thinking about power supplies and so forth. So where I've settled for, uh, the milk comes out in this uh, line here. This is all under a vacuum. From all the cows on the milking parlour, it'll be co collected into this what's called a receiver jar. And because all of this system is under a vacuum, you then have to have a milk pump here, which then pumps the milk out of the vacuum to atmospheric pressure, and it can then go into a cooling tank. So I've been using, um, putting my systems uh, on point C here. Um, and here are a couple of farms, uh, just to show that the previous slide is very simplified. Um, this is at Hartbury, which is a herringbone parlour. Um, they often look like you know, when you've just eaten the herring, um, that pattern. Um, you know, we've got, I think, 10 or 12 cows either side um, there. Uh, the problem is it tends to milk in batches, so they'll milk this side. Uh, and while that side's been milking, they'll get this side ready uh, and then vice versa. OK, uh, this parlour, some of you recognise? That looks like uh, our parlour. Yeah, it, it's here. Um, it, it's, the, it's the one up at, um, just around the corner next to the pig unit, because the pig unit's making its presence felt today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some days. Yeah, but not the cows. OK. Um, OK, so those of you not familiar with milking parlours, we've got, what, 30, 40 cows here on a carousel around about. This moves slowly around. Can't quite work out, but I think, yeah, the cows come in here and go out there. Uh, and on this one, uh, the staff come down the ladder and stand on the inside. Um, yeah, I think there's one staff member there. Um, it does allow one or two staff members to milk a lot of cows. 
everything's going round until this point here, um, where there's a, a very fancy pivot point. Uh, and so that's where I've chosen to make uh, to measure the milk temperature. Right. So how do we measure the milk temperature? Um, so using particle borns um, now, um, and using thermistors, uh, which are fairly simple and cheap uh, to measure temperature. Uh, they're very robust. They need a little bit of handling because a slight sniff of wind and they change temperature. And the question mark about calibration is to me to go and revisit my calibrations. Um, trying to collect data very frequently and do as much processing as we can on the microprocessor unit. Um, and got some algorithms in there that sort out when the cows are being milked and when they're not. Um, in terms of what we're using hardware, uh, this is an analog signal that comes in from here because these are effectively resistors, uh, uh, variable resistors. Um, so you could change that variation in resistance into a variation in voltage. Uh, and then you can use an analog to digital converter um, to convert it uh, into a digital number. Uh, and 16 bits give you an idea of how precise you can be. Um, you can use software to boost that. Um, sorry, Joe. Sorry. All right, I'll carry on. Um, and again, we've got to think about outliers. So I'm, I'm quite a fan of medians as a fairly simple way. Because um, you haven't got, if you're collecting you know, every 10, 15 seconds, you haven't got an infinite amount of processing time and power. Um, so you need to be fairly simple. So my favorite is a median of three. Median of anything bigger, you have to sort it and you haven't got memory to sort and things. OK, so sort of results we're getting. Uh, in here under that Jubilee clip uh, is a thermistor, um, which is measuring the temperature of the milk. This is the milk pump here. The veins of the pump are in there, uh, and this is the exit on the milk pump. So that's probably always full of milk. OK, and you can see that during milking, temperatures run in the mid 30s. Cow's body temperature is 37, 38 degrees, so it has dropped a little bit. OK, uh, after milking, it drops considerably. Uh, this is in the summer, so this is environmental temperature, so it drops at night. And then every morning, uh, they give the milking plant a darn good wash with hot water. So that's sort of the reason for that spike. OK, but you can already start to see in some of the first data I collected, it made me think maybe I can do something that we're getting. Uh, this is the daytime ones. The cows have been out in the field all day um, in the hot sunshine. Temperature is 35 degrees. Uh, if they're kept, if they go out, they went out again, but they're out at night uh, in the dark. Uh, no solar radiation. Temperatures drop down to about 34 degrees centigrade. Um, so yeah, hoping that we can use, my hope is that we can use this difference uh, and relate that to milk yields um, and uh, THIs and so forth. OK. Um, just to come back to this, um, looking at the effects of heat stress, was a graph we had previously. They fitted a quadratic to it, um, rightly or wrongly, but you could probably, as validly, I think, put a uh, a broken stick regression to that. Yeah. Simpler. Yeah. It's simpler. Um, I was taught uh, when I was at Reading that you broken sticks don't apply to populations, but. Mm. Uh, it is a lot simpler, uh, and if we want to do edge processing, uh, it's got some attractions. Uh, so this is suggesting that uh, milk yields don't really change as the THI goes up to about 66, and from 66 onwards, uh, they start dropping away. Um, this was out in Queensland, but you speak to British farmers and they'll say much the same, uh, and the data we've got suggests much the same. Um, THI, this is the, the, the average THI, has quite an effect on, on the vertical temperatures here as well, which is probably the best way, the closest you're going to get to measuring core body temperature. And it probably is just about the same. Um, it's reasonably simple to measure on the uh, experimental basis, not very possible uh, on a commercial basis. Um, 
So again, we can start to see a broken stick approach. So where am I going to go next? Uh, what, well, what do I want to do? Firstly, let's see how much uh, heat stress we've been getting you know, from thinking about it over the past two summers. Yes, we do get heat stress episodes. Uh, how does that change the THI? What does that look to do to uh, the predicted milk yields or actual milk yields? Uh, and then got some background data uh, as can we see a, a change in milk temperatures as well. Um, so then wanting to relate milk temperatures ideally to uh, changes in milk yield, because um, that's the bit the farmers really worry about. And then can we use that sort of data uh, to predict um, what the heat load is from milk temperatures? Um, so I'm stuck at mini tab and regression analysis. So that's why I'm here. Uh, and that's why I'm asking you folks, can we come up with better methods? But they do have, I do want them to be delivered on farm uh, through edge processing mm -hmm. because these folks don't have brilliant internet access. Mm. Um, and some commercial companies are starting to say, yeah, internet cost of moving data around the internet and around the cloud is restricting how much we can analyze. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to move to the edge. OK, so that was all I had to say. Uh, thank you very much for, for hanging on in there on a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, this is just some far, uh, a picture of cows on a reasonably hot day in the summer. In that shed are 150 cows. This farm supplies one of the better supermarkets or the posher supermarkets in the country. And that posh supermarket says all cows must go out to graze because that's what Enid Blyton said they did. <laughs> uh, you know, it's nice for cows to go out. So there's the open gate. Uh, it's not in the picture, but when I was around there, there's three cows in the field. There's 150 in there eating food, business as normal. And then the thing I found fun when I took this picture is we've got four cows here hugging the shade. Uh, I really don't want to go out into the sunshine. <laughs> OK, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, any questions? George, I'm going to read. George, do you want to come online and, and read and say what it is? Hiya. Yeah. Yeah, sorry if my dog barks. Um, she's a bit loud at the minute. It's that time of day when everyone's coming home. Um, yeah, my question was when you mentioned about taking the milk from taking the temperature during milking. Majority of milking is morning and evening. Yeah. So what is the relationship between that and that hottest period of the day? So how do you know at that point? Because surely the the cow in theory has had time to somewhat cool down so the full effect of the heat stress might not be fully known yes yeah there is a sort of averaging out there um heat stress also gets called heat load and a, a simple analogy is, is it's a bucket that various ways of pouring heat in and it slowly fills up if the bucket overflows the cow dies if the bucket's half empty or half full uh, she's probably suffering um, so, yes, we're getting two occasions to measure um, you know, how much heat load the cows are suffering from. Cows don't move in a very fast world. I don't know if you saw, there's a two day lag between cows being in hot weather and milk yields going down. So I'm hoping that if we can see it morning and evening, that's enough. And it's all, yeah, and there's probably some averaging going on within the cow. She doesn't acquire and shed heat that fast either. So I'm hoping uh, that I'll get away with it. <laughs> you know, it, it's just interesting because obviously the whole, the, your whole concept is about focusing on the cow and each individual cow. So I just kind of thought, well, it's interesting because we're assuming that there is that lag with regards to the milk yield drops and the intake drops. But it's the same way as like when we're first poorly, we have might have a headache before we actually throw up. Do you know? Do you know what I mean? Yes. Like, that, oh yes. Yeah. You yeah. know. Th that There's also. Theory. Yeah. Uh, when the cow's temperature starts going up, she's lost control. Mm -hmm. So there'll be a period before that when she's struggling to maintain control. Yeah. She's got a heat load problem, but she's struggling to maintain it. Mm. Uh, now, whether uh, hopefully we can talk about it on on Friday. Because I'm back again on Friday. Whether we can regress backwards. 
and say, yeah, we can see what we got. You know, we started getting problems a bit earlier on. Um, I don't yeah. know. Um, yeah, no, I think I think it's a good point. And my other point was when you showed the milk pump where you were taking the temperature measurement from within the dairy, does that just amalgamate the average for that Pacific, that point within within milking, so it's not actually per cow. It'll be for whoever, yeah. Who it'll be for a mob of cows. That doesn't worry me so much in terms of what am I going to do with that information. I'm not going to go out and change things for individual cows. Any corrections I impose will be on a group level. Also, okay. the milk yield data from from the herd level as opposed to from individuals. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, this farm and also the university farm actually have milk yield data for every cow every morning and every afternoon. Oh, okay. So yeah. We can, interesting. That's interesting. Selected automatically and and ignored. Mm. Yeah. And I, I, I'm happy I work at, at working at the group level. I wonder if, because you mentioned that you do a lot of work on the National Milk Records database, because that will have individual cow yields and individual milking data. It if will, there's yeah. some kind of once you've established this relationship, if you can move on to that one and pull weather data for a location and correlate it with the milk yields at that time over time. Yeah, the only snag with uh, national with NMR records, that sort of things, it's once a month. Yeah. So it's fairly infrequent. And in, mm -hmm. with UK weather, heat waves been and gone mm. in a month. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks, George. Question from Matt. Matt. Oh, hi. Yeah, thanks. It's a very interesting presentation. Thanks for that. Um, I've got a couple of questions. First of all, um, you've, you've mentioned more than once removing outliers uh, by using sort of median, uh, you know, averaging out. What, what do you think was causing the outliers? Is it a particular sensor that's giving trouble? There aren't many sensors on, on these. Um, so I, in my, I don't know. If I haven't looked, I haven't gone back and said where they're coming from that much. Um, on some of them things, if, you, if it's an outside temperature sensor, uh, it may be the sun's gone in or something stood in front of it. Uh, if it's an indoor one, it may be that you know, most buildings have skylights. And as the sun comes round, sometimes these things are in the sunshine, sometimes they're not. Oh, OK, yeah, I just wondered there was a yeah. common, common cause. On the milk yield data, I looked a little bit more why we get outliers. It's either because the milking cluster fell off halfway through mm -hmm. and the whole thing got reset, mm -hmm. uh, or occasionally the system doesn't spot one cow's gone and another cow's come in. Mm -hmm. So the number you've got is actually the milk yield for two successive cows. My other question was whether um, is there an equal and opposite problem if the cows get too cold? Is that is that a problem? For dairy cows in the UK, probably not, because they've got this huge fermentation vat going on in there. Uh, so, so, so is it fair to say cooler is better? Yeah, in the UK, yeah, cooler is better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. It. So I guess the strategy might just be put the fans on and leave them on. <laughs> that's not very sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> Solar power fans, obviously. Yeah. You haven't been paying electricity bills recently. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we, we um, really should. Yeah. yeah it, we, okay. I think it's that, sensible that... to limit how much any, uh, resources we put in here. Uh, yeah. They're watching electricity bills because of cost. Uh, and the milk buyers are bashing them about sustainability uh, and uh, you know carbon neutral and so forth. Yeah. So I think going forwards, we really yeah, just turning the fans on and leaving them on, which is really what we're doing at the moment. Uh, we could do better. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Go. Yes, hello. I, I can try and speak, but my internet seems to be a bit intermittent. So I, I can read the questions. The first one is quite a simple answer. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm getting my head around one thing first. Um, I'm, the interesting thing is that robots, I think the Laylee robot does report, report temperatures of the milk. 
Um, they don't do it very accurately. Uh, and speaking to my newest friends in uh, Melbourne, Australia, uh, you can't extract the data from their system. Uh, and that yeah. is a problem with a lot of these systems. They're very much proprietary software yeah. and you can't just wade in and pull out um, a, a CSV file. Yeah, um, I suppose it, it's, it's sort of acceptable to look at it on a herd level as well, isn't it, rather than worrying about individual cows? I think certainly on a, a pen or a group level, because if you want just about every technology we've got to mitigate heat stress, you're going to apply at a pen or a group level. You know, feed additives, fans, soakers, and those, and so forth. Uh, I don't think anyone's proposing you find a system uh, where you say, oh yeah, that cow needs a bit more tree, uh, uh, mitigation than that one. Yeah. Um, but my, I suppose my, my other question, I suppose that the other question there, overestimating heat stress, because high yield is potentially higher heat stress. Yeah, uh, true. If, if we talk, that might sort of, how that would impact your data, whether you'd end up with a slight bias in it, but I suppose you, it's how you account for that, isn't it? But if you only treat the, it's like ration formulation, if you only treat the average cow, anything above the average is going to be suffering. Yeah. So you actually do want to set your threshold slightly higher than the average. You want to work, your threshold wants to be the sort of the top, three quarter, you know, top quarter, uh, top quartile, I guess. Yeah, but you're right. I don't know yet. Um, hopefully, in the next uh, few months, I'll learn. And I suppose your abatement strategies are never are very rarely going to negatively impact the individual, the cows, rather than potentially the cost of running the fans or adding other stuff into the feed, etc. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't think there's a downside of financial, apart from the financial downside. As far as the cow is concerned, there isn't a downside of being of receiving treatment when you didn't need it. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what? Yeah. The, the, other, the I suppose the other question is, um, what about other ways of monitoring heat stress in cows? Then is do you think this is the right way? Because I know there's a a bolus now, isn't there, that will sit intravenously that will report temperatures. I know cow manager do a peripheral temperature on yep. the ear tags, but they're not very good. Um, yeah. Oh yes, there's others about. Yeah, and there's a one Smax Tech and a couple of others. I have boluses in the room end, uh, and they're beginning to um, to report heat stress. Uh, there's one of one of the collars that's about uh, that has a heavy breathing monitor. Yeah, so I've got a sense of humour with the man who named the person who named that, but yeah, uh, <laughs> which is picking up respiration. And there are folks trying to pick up respiration with cameras, mm. Um, mm. which is is, is a, a viable option. I just frightened by the volumes of data. Mm. Um, mm. And then there's some an American team I was reading about recently who want to put an implant in the ear, which will measure temperature, and then it will transmit that information to a backpack that the cow's got on, and then that yeah. goes across the law to somewhere else. But I just thought getting permission to put that on commercial farms is, is going to be an uphill struggle. Even just to get a company to start funding it is going to be a bit of a bugger. Yeah, I think the computer vision could be interesting because you can feed in then other aspects of the behaviour, can't you? Like the, the bunching and feeding time. Yes, yeah. Oh, might could, yeah. Yes. Recognise heat stress then. Yeah, yeah. That's why I was wondering about is something like an infrared camera that identifies the udder. That's the part that gets hotter. Yeah. Uh, and, and makes a classification call. So it's zeros and ones is the data. Yeah. yeah. Another place that's very good for measuring cow's temperature is actually the eye, because mm. the eye is so close to the brain, which is at a mm. constant temperature. Mm. Uh, so there's an American out in California wondering whether he can put open it, point an infrared camera at cow's eyes as they go around on the rotary parlour. Mm. Uh, but he's a bit nervous about putting five thousand pounds worth of camera that close to a cow. <laughs> that is one. And the other one, I understand, I've never worked with them, um, don't know whether Matt knows, but infrared cameras aren't that easy to calibrate. Mm. I think they're one doing things. Mm. So there's some people giving some thought as to can you they're work expensive. out. They're expensive. They're expensive is the thing. They're expensive is the thing. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Um, they're 5,000 quid. Uh, the most expensive bits I've got are sort of 100 pounds. Mm. George, you have another one? 
Yeah, no, I was just kind of picking up on the point for um, the computer vision side of it, because we have situations where we just go around with our phone, you plug on, you know, the thermal imaging camera, really cheap and easy, and you just literally take a picture of a distribution board and it'll show you if there could be any potential faults due to the heat um, when doing NIC, IC inspections. And it might be something that can be quite simple to just have a farmer, he's milking anyway, takes a picture of the cow's udder and it records the temperature. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, and you can, from those pictures I've shown, uh, it's been like that. Yeah, but yeah. I wanted, and I, we applied for some Innovate money for this, uh, and you have to make persuade the world it's very commercial, it's, you know, it's scalable, it's going to be you know, the best thing since sliced bread. Um, so I was wanting something that wasn't dependent on someone else's technology, uh, like it would be data out of a robot or a smack tech or something, uh, that you could apply fairly cheaply uh, to a, a wide range of commercial farms. So that, that's where I came from. Um, and I've been data collecting for a while, so I'm a bit invested in this, George. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think I think it's great, but you know, it's it's one of those things where it's like, obviously, we're always looking for the next best thing, aren't we? But yeah, no, I th I think it's brilliant, and I, it'll be interesting to have a look at your data as well. Oh, I think that buckets and buckets of that. <laughs> and I've really enjoyed your presentation as well. It's been a good presentation. All right, thank you. In, a, in our last minute, I have a, one last question, and it's a purely stats question. Could I get you to back up? You'll need to click on your slide there again, and you'll need to click. Oh, yeah. And then back up to the yeah, this one, the that one right here. What it looks like to me there is that, um, and, and I'm thinking of uh, purely as a statistician here, the thing that drops me on the ground when I look at this graph is that there's a small variance for cool cows and a huge variance for hot cows. And what do you make of the uh, fact that some, in, I assume, I'm assuming here that those uh, individual symbols are individual cows? Yeah, the group size isn't very big, five or six cows. Um, so you've got repeats within there. Um, the lines, are, it's very, you know, I don't know how you put it, but the resolution of the data isn't that good. Everything's in a line vertically or horizontally. I can see. Um, but I don't think those are cows. Um, so you have some on average in the hot cow group that yeah. are just as low as in the cool cow group. But, yes. But then the uh, the hot temperatures go way up. And I'm also looking at the range of that, that it's uh, a little deceptive. from A very naughty graph. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 38 to 40. Yeah. yeah. Even more naughty and really quite amazing when someone decided to put a simple regression line to it. <laughs> no oh, comment. No, no, no. It got published. Um, okay, yeah. Okay. So what we've got there probably is maybe genetic variation, maybe milk yield variation. Mm. Size so of I can't, surface area to volume ratio variation. Wouldn't have thought so. I think mm. cows are all much the same size, aren't they, Joe? Big. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say. <laughs> the, the, there is, there is still that in, in, in a genital distance, which might play into it to a certain extent. Thinking of feces passing through, it might have some aspect on it, but I don't know. I'm only I mean, guessing. Vaginal temperatures, Joe, if you've got too many feces in there, they're not going to be a very successful breeding animal, are they? No, but they're nearby. It's near nearby. Oh, it is, yes, yeah. Yeah. Or is a fast way to shed heat if, if you're just holding a lot in your core and you uh, extract some poop that's hot, it could lower your core temperature. Is that is that what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah, that's sort yeah. of ballpark. Um, could be bad looks. That, that's the striking thing to me. I mean, it's so clear what's uh, the difference between uh, a yeah. okay. cow and a, I'm thinking yeah. logistic yeah. regression. Uh, Yes, um, zero. but it's not, but I'm not, I'm wanting, I don't want a, a zero one output. Hmm. I'm wanting a, a a scaled output. Yeah, okay. Okay, it could be, it could be a, a logistic regression with, with multiple categories, more than two. Yeah, we could band it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting.
That that's a really striking graph to me because of the variance difference between the cool and the hot cows. Yeah. I, well, yeah. Okay. So yeah, thinking aloud, none of these cows are suffering heat stress. Mm -hmm. Some of these cows are suffering heat stress. Some aren't. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, what it's showing, isn't it, is that the the the, the self-regulating you know part of the body that's doing the temperature breaks down at a certain point, and then then all bets are off. That, yeah, like a, well, that point varies between cows. Um, yeah. Yeah, because these cows haven't got to that point, even at a fairly high uh, THI, whereas others, it may be she's giving 50 litres and she's giving 30 litres. Now, the yields aren't incredible. So this one could be giving 25 litres. That one could be giving 50 litres. I must go back and look at the paper again, but I suspect they won't tell us. Mm. I, I think it would be... I, I think it would be interesting to f get the raw data for that paper if it's available, like maybe message or something, just because it would be interesting to see by cow, like colour coding those dots by each individual cow. And if there yeah. is any matches, like the same cow might have the same kind of increase and then that will allow you to that will allow you to better understand your average data. Yeah, I, OK, I, I suspect. 2011 open access data wasn't happening, but there is, I'll, I'll bring it along on Friday, there's another data set from, from Madison, um, uh, which is much better and it's only just been done by a PhD student. Mm. So I suspect that data is still available. How um, much of your uh, heat sensor data do you have from the carousel here? None. Oh, you don't have any? No, no. Oh, you've just taken a picture of the carousel here. I thought it was appropriate. OK, yeah, yeah. it's highly appropriate. Yeah. yeah. Now, these are they're all from uh, commercial farms. Mm. Um, yeah, there's, there isn't a research farm in there anymore. anymore. OK, interesting. Yeah. We should get one in as soon as possible because it will be a stream of data that we have access yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. It's it really, uh, I didn't mention it when you uh, let you go on in your talk, but uh, the reason I asked about whether there's individual cow data is I've never seen the individual cow data. I've only been given the uh, milking session data and the number of cows. Yeah. And I asked uh, many times uh, in various ways, is there individual cow data? And I was told no. So well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm to that. 99% certain there is individual okay. data. You have to know how to extract it. OK. Uh, and yeah, luckily I had some help from Geo a while ago. And we wrote the little algorithm that pulls out that data. Mm. But if you want an ugly, ugly data set, that's mm. one of them. Well, the data set, the average data set I have is hideous. So uh, <laughs> <it's> even, <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I thought that's great. We're going to have to stop there. Uh, so I have to go do my fatherly duty and uh, collect my son. But um, that was a fantastic talk. Thanks, Joe. Uh, thanks, everyone else. And we'll see you next week. Yeah, I'm around for the next couple of days. Um, if anyone wants to uh, bend my ear a bit more. Mm. Uh, if Matt wants to look at the hardware, I'm happy to share that with you. Mm. It's in the car. It's a bit dirty. Bring the particle Friday because I would like to look at it. Matt, I think we'll be here Friday as well for the lab meeting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll bring some bits and pieces in. All right. Final comments? Anything? If not, good night, everyone. All right. Thank okay. you, guys. Bye. Thanks a lot, then. Bye, then. Thanks for your Bye. Bye. Just leave. I'll just uh, close it because sometimes if the people stay in there. And... Oh, right. Yeah, they don't go. <laughs> <laughs> they linger on, do they? Yeah. yeah.